Hello, Casa community. My name is Christy. I'm the founding director of the Casa Project, coming to you from the land of the Web3. Today, we're joined by Daniel Keller, the co-founder and CSO of Flux, which has a very interesting spin about how we can turn cloud and blockchain and bring it together in a way so that we can build the application that serves many users while getting the trust and minimization of uh, trust that we would need to be able to build a decentralized future. Welcome, Daniel. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Chris, and I really look forward to talking uh, with you. We were talking a little bit there before we got live. I really like what you guys are doing, and, and really, and when you say coming from the land of Web three, now now that's a first for me. So we're in <laughs> we're in the land of Web three, and I and I love it. I love it. I love what you guys are doing too. So I am uh, I'm Daniel Keller. I'm the chief strategy officer and co-founder at both Flux and Zellcore. We are a decentralized computational network. And what that what does that mean? Well, we were Web3 before Web3 was cool. So we're mm -hmm. about four and a half years old. Uh, we worked for the better part of three years building our decentralized network. And when I say decentralized, I mean, it is completely decentralized. Uh, uh, we have a proof of work uh, algorithm that is our consensus mechanism um, and transactional validators. But we also had our node network, which r it allows you to deploy at scale on enterprise-based infrastructure, um, uh, any type of DAP that you can dockerize, uh, you can deploy it directly on Flux. And we are also working toward Kubernetes and other other platforms as well that will be able to be deployed directly on Flux. So in a nutshell, what I always tell people is we're kind of like the AWS of blockchain. And I know that mm -hmm. sounds cliche, but it's kind of what we're doing. And, and you know, it's, a, it's the closest thing we can gravitate toward. It's really interesting, right? Because when people think about AWS and cloud, they think of that as an architecture that is in competition for Web3. But if you look at the actual node infrastructure that runs a lot of these proof of stake network and even some proof of work network, <laughs> There's a lot of AWS servers behind those. Yeah, DeFi is not so DeFi, is it, Chris? I mean, and that's that's one of the things that uh, you know we saw very early on was you're, it's very it's very difficult to be a well developed project in the ecosystem talking about decentralization and not have your infrastructure ran on. If AWS goes down and your project goes down, you're not decentralized, and that is exactly what. Flux kind of set out to do was we want to be the folks selling uh, pickaxes and shovels and pans to the gold rush. Uh, we're a pure infrastructure play in, the, in, in, that, in that way. We let other people go out and do the fancy, bright and shiny things, the metaverse, the NFTs, the, you know, uh, DeFi's of the world. And we're, what we're going to do is we're going to power it all. So whether you're Web 3, Web 4, Web 5, Web 50, it doesn't matter. It's going to run on Flux. And that's that's kind of the cool thing that we like. So what's really interesting, you mentioned Dockerize. You know, Docker is a technology coming from the Linux world that came from Linux containers, which is basically, say, on the same physical bare metal machine, you can run uh, efficiently uh, yes. many, many copies of an isolated to some degree of efficiency and, and, mm -hmm. and isolation uh, so that people can deploy their software, their, their, mm -hmm. their runtime and whatever it might be, in a shared environment, still providing the sense of you, you have your little... Uh, little thing. Uh, there are projects that talk about decentralized computing that has their own programming language, have their own uh, unique way of like deploying in different APIs. You've chosen to kind of piggyback on not even Web two, Web one, maybe Web zero, right? Yeah. Uh, the 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 kind of Unix kind of that kind of philosophy. Can you tell us about those choices and and from a developer looking at deploying something uh, in a decentralized way? Why choose to use something that uh, kind of ground itself in the Unix Linux movement versus learning a new programming language, a new deployment model like Canister with ICP and et cetera? Well, you know, the big thing about it, 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 the way that I see it is old technology is not necessarily old technology. We looked at the Linux distribution model and exactly how the, you know, some of the things that we, we could do there as well. And we didn't want to lim limit ourselves to one. We, we want to be agnostic to platforms. So whether you learned in JavaScript or Python or whatever, you've developed a, a you know, a front end or a back end that's, that, that needs to be deployed, we could care less. As long as you can dockerize it into a container, you can deploy it directly on Flux. And what that did was it allowed us to be more more like Web 2 in the sense that we're more mm -hmm. inclusive to everyone building their platforms out. And, and also it does it makes an easy transition for folks that are moving from Web 2 to Web 3 because we're not we're not maximalists. We don't believe that Web 2 just goes away tomorrow. It just disappears and AWS you know, becomes Web 3. Um, we believe there's going to be this hybrid symbi symbiotic relationship between Web 2 and Web 3. And this seem to us the best way to kind of bridge that gap and and you'll hear us talking quite a bit about it uh, in, in the sense that you know we we want to make sure that we have infrastructure that uh, that, that developers can utilize so one of our, our big things was our project jetpack where we really were 
working on dev toolkits to to make it seamless to, to deploy on Flux. So mm -hmm. the answer to your question is uh, we look at old technologies, we find exactly what works, and sometimes you parlay that into what you're doing now because it's relevant again. Mm -hmm. You know, when I looked at the type of application or dApps or even regular apps that can run in your thing, there seems to be a different category, cat categories of things. There are yep. people running like nodes, blockchain nodes on your network, kind of substituting for a uh, subscription service from like QuickNode or Alchemy or whatever it might be. And there are people running uh, kind of dApps and there's some people yep. running what more like what more look like op like last generation open source software, like yes. running your own mail servers. What do you think is the proportion of usage of this network that you have and what are you seeing the trending towards more dApps more existing kind of migration from hosting in trusted infrastructure uh, or is it mostly around this whole idea of like running your own full node especially proof of stake have a lot of incentive for people to do that so I think it's a little bit of all of that, and and I'll, and I'll tell you why. As is as, as as we continue to keep developing out, we were blockchain by birth. So in other words, mm -hmm. you know, we came into the, into the ecosystem with decentralization at our heart. A bunch of cypherpunks all got got together, and they decided they wanted a better internet. Uh, so we've naturally gravitated toward blockchain-based projects, and especially in DeFi, because again, it goes back to fix a problem. When you say you're a decentralized finance, you're you're in DeFi, and you're running on AWS, you're not really a decentralized finance piece. So we we found a lot of 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 headwind of projects that we're looking to develop out and be more decentralized at their core. For instance, KDA, who is one of our our, our partner projects that we work with. Um, is they had, they wanted to make sure that they were completely decentralized across the board. So what they did is they launched a node incentivization program and they allowed people to actually be incentivized for deploying decentralized infrastructure. So, and we do that right on Flux today. So you can run a, you know, a KDA full node. You can also mm -hmm. run chain web data and other, other components of, of their platform. But with that, we're quickly expanding into different areas where um, uh, we're outside of the normal, I would say, blockchain tech, tech stack and moving mm. more into the standard technical stack where we have people vetting us out uh, specifically, not necessarily to just uh, assume all of their technology overnight, but act as almost like a, uh, a wetlands, so to speak. Mm. So uh, they deploy on Web2. Web they have a, a footprint on Web3. It's this load balanced piece that works between both ones and they're, and, and, and they're really just kind of this hybrid ecosystem. That allows people that are in the Web2 infrastructure and they're uncomfortable. Uh, I was on a, on a call with uh, literally board members who, who, uh, of a major Fortune 200 company and we were mm -hmm. talking about Web3 and about halfway through the uh, conversation, one of the senior vice presidents stops me and he says, so you're telling me that my data will be on all these decentralized servers ran by regular individuals all over the world. And I said, that's exactly what I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. He says, that's terrifying. I said, <laughs> well, I've heard that before. And do you want to know where I heard that? 13 years ago when I started pitching cloud to the bare metal folks who were running their mm -hmm. own infrastructure and controlling all those pieces. And yeah. he... Kind of out of the corner of his mouth, he said, touche. So, you know, I, th I think what we're trying to do is make sure that we're very inclusive to all these different tech stacks. And, and I think that you, you see everything from it utilitarian, uh, so backends that are running servers, to and game servers. We have uh, Minecraft uh, uh, Bedrock Editions that's been deployed. We're really making a push toward uh, blockchain gaming as well. So mm -hmm. those are big pieces. Um and really just NFT platforms, the ability to host your own, you know, NFT data right directly on, on, on Flux. Uh, I mean, pretty much anything you can imagine. If you can Dockerize it, you can deploy it on Flux. And that's what kind of really is a unique uh, difference from us and everyone else. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So when we are talking about servers that is run by someone else, you know, anywhere that might be that's incentivized to run a node, uh, what kind of persistence can I get? And if someone turns off my server or, or somehow the server turns away, what do I get as a person who have, you know, built my community in Minecraft or whatever new games? Uh, what's your persistence model for these ephemeral uh, instances? Or do, that do you have a, a backing story for that? That's a that's a great question. We have persistent data uh, uh, currently on Flux, but it isn't at the level that we believe it needs to be for mm. for for more corporate developed database pieces, right? So we you know we want to make sure that we have that redundancy in place. Currently, if you deploy, you deploy on a minimum of five nodes. Um, mm -hmm. If one node goes down, we deploy another node in its place. I see. Um, our persistent storage, uh, which is getting ready, ready to be released, uh, kind of partners in with our with our project Titan, which is our partnership with Lumen Technology. And if you're not familiar with Lumen, Lumen is, 
I would say the better part of 50% of all web traffic uh, flows through uh, Lumen. And mm -hmm. so that's a, that's a Web2 company that understands the value of Web3 and understands that it isn't just going to be a one and done. There'll be a Web2 symbiotic relationship with Web3, and that's what we're developing around. So mm -hmm. um, absolutely, 100% uh, persistent storage is is, is it's essential to every project and we should have that in lockdown. It's currently in beta test and, and we'll roll that out here within the next, um, you know, several months. Yeah. I think that's the main difference between like running a node where you can say, if I lose the drive or something like that, you can always resync. I mean, it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Imagine resyncing mainnet for Ethereum since the beginning of uh, Homestead. Uh, but the, but, but, you know, I think for these kind of secondary web 2.5 use cases or web three deployment yep. or web two yep. use cases, uh, those are certainly something that DevOps people that I know it's like, they, they, it's the second question they ask. I'm just relaying it as, as I know, those are something they were interested yep, in. Yep. Absolutely. And we could have had uh, persistent storage, we could have done what other platforms did, and that is partner with a third party, bring them on. But there and again, uh, you're, you're depending on a third party that's going to deploy on, on your infrastructure and whatever mm -hmm. they are doing. So our our choice was to say, no, let's let's wait it out. Let's build it decentralized in a decentralized manner so it can be deployed you know, across Flux. And we mm -hmm. feel comfortable with it. Many of the tools that we have that, that we use on the Flux network, we had to create them. Because yeah. as you start as you start building out this decentralized network, you really quickly start to realize, well, we need a self-sovereign ID. Well, that's LID. We had to build that. We had uh, we want to use decentralized two-factor or we want to use two-factor uh, authentication, but we don't want to use Google because that would go against exactly what we're trying to do. So we had to build decentralized two-factor authentication. Mm -hmm. We need a platform. We need a portal. We need access so people can access Web3 and almost like a web browser on the blockchain. And that's what Zellcore is, which is powered by Flux. So mm -hmm. all these things are are very unique in the sense that we're not we're not rushing to market to be the first. We're we're rushing to market to be the most decentralized and to provide the most value for our customers as well, because our customers are going to be the, the individuals, not only in corporate America, but they're normal folks that are running just regular servers and infrastructures, small mom and pop shops that are just, you know, developing. And this is a way for them to do it affordably, decentralized and very on demand scale. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. You mentioned Zell Core and the word Zell seems familiar. Uh, were you guys known as the Zell project or like the Zell token? When does the flux and Zell kind of uh, um, uh, transition happen? So we were born into the world of Zell Cash in 2018 and right in the middle of the clutches of a beginning of a bear market. And then, of course, built over the next three years um, in 2021, the beginning of 2021, we rebranded to Flux to unify mm -hmm. our brand. And it really became our own uh, our own project. So essentially, Zell was a just a standard fork of Zcash. And then what we did was we took that chain and made it our own. So mm -hmm. we, 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 we developed out our deterministic nodes and our infrastructure on the back end there. We developed all the platform pieces that needed to snap in uh, to, you know, the utilities in the toolbox, so to speak, to, to develop it out. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's how we were born in the, into the world. And like I say, we were birth, uh, birthed by blockchain because we were all miners at heart, yeah, cypherpunks, yeah. the individuals who, like, we sat around and we said, what do we want to do with this project? Um, and every one of us, the same people that are on the project then are the same people that are on the project now, and their ethos is, is commitment. So, you know, one of the rules when you work for Flux is you don't work for any other project. So there's no other, you know, working with other crypto projects or standard projects. If you're on the Flux side of the ecosystem, a Flux side of the world, that's where you're at. So you don't have any conflict of interest. And, and all the people that are working on our projects are really honestly cypherpunks at heart. They're folks <laughs> that they believe in decentralization. They believe in developing the product and uh, they believe in the mission. And of course, if, if you have the mission at heart, uh, you know, financial windfall or, you know, is the byproduct of a successful mission. So that's kind of where that's kind of where they're at. Yeah, I think I, we, it resonates with us a lot. I mean, we, you know, all of our team that a good part of our team, you know, we were working together since 2014. Uh, and, you know, the mission is, you know, our mission is like kind of you're like infrastructure and you're selling shuffles. We're selling kind of like the experience layer. Yes. So we believe that the composability of smart contracts and blockchains and assets translates to the UI. And yes. thinking about how to decompose and recompose in a secure and usable way, and that, yes. that's sometimes in direct contradiction, uh, like many other things <laughs> like that in, in, in our field, is like it's finding the right way of, of merging two contradictory ideas to make something coherent. And the one thing we've learned is that uh, a lot of people who uh, come and go in the in the DAP field would like use the modern JavaScript or like whatever is hip, and then they abandon the project and the website is no longer accessible. Yep. Like, uh, and a lot of NFT projects 
I'm sure in the next two, three years may not even be viewable, right? Yeah. Like Cr- you have crickets, metadata. Right, yeah, I mean, it's gonna be rough. So, you know, our approach is taking this idea that the the code and the application is distributed permanently, uh, much like a packet manager, but if we can leverage decentralized storage network like IPFS and pin them, you know, the app, the JavaScript can be available forever. Now, obviously in the indexing services, those needs to be kept up and there needs to be incentive to run it. But the actual app itself, it's like 100K of JavaScript, right? Like, mm-hmm. why do we want to put that at risk? So what's your sense of the decentralization of front end uh, is you know obviously we can put 100k of JavaScript on a uh, a, a a a Flux node and run it that way, uh, or we can upload it to IPFS and have caching company cache it like Cloudflare. Uh, what's your view on what DApps hosting would look like in a more decentralized ways versus having a company run an AWS architecture and then basically control pretty much the entire path from indexing to to uh, to uh, transaction submission uh, as an yeah. intermediary. Yeah, I want to I want to just back up one second and and, and let you know that uh, we recently de- deployed IPFS on Flux as well. So we, hmm. we yeah, it's been it's been quite a, a unique couple of weeks as we kind of got through that discernment process ourselves because we we ask these we ask ourselves these questions quite often. Is like uh, what what are we doing? How are we doing it? You know, at what scale? We're very agile. We think about you know how these things are going to play out. Mm-hmm. So the answer to your question is is um you know it's we want to be as available for anyone to deploy as, as humanly possible, but we don't necessarily know what technology is going to yield for us in the next six months. I mean, in, in the crypto space, six months is like a hundred years. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're, we're going yeah. so fast and we're iterating so quickly. So we didn't want to lim- limit ourselves to any one particular, um, you know, let's say we didn't want to put all our chips in one bet. Uh, we wanted mm-hmm. to make sure that w- that we were allowing uh, um, iterations to the technology. And really, honestly, disruptive te- technology is exactly what we're doing. We're learning every single day. If it was a, if it was a fleshed out and developed project, that would be Web two. You know, these are disruptive technologies, and the, there are unique opportunities, just like you mentioned. Mm-hmm. You know, when when I when I mentioned. Uh, when I was like, you know, learning about the, the the origin of your project, you know, obviously you have that Zcash fault. What's your sense of privacy? Obviously, on-chain privacy on the type of uh, 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 blockchain that provides that is 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 available, but not commonly used. And if you look mm-hmm. at a lot of the blockchains on the Ethereum Solana side, they are not private uh, or Aztec announced something today that was private on top of CK, on top of the row up structure. Uh, mm-hmm. What's your sense of the importance of privacy, not only on the financial ledger side, but also on the data? Let's say I put some sensitive data, I have a node that has some yep. information about uh, uh, that, that, that may be interesting in some other party. What, what is the sensitivity around the node operator having access to that information? So a couple of things there that I want to point out. So the first thing uh, is the, is the fact that we were a fork of Zcash, but we did remove the privacy features. Okay. And you're going to say, well, why did you remove the p- privacy features? Because that is an important part. We believe that uh, the ecosystem that we've created, uh, that there are other people that do privacy better than mm. what we do. Um, so, you know, we had to pick and choose exactly what our battles would be. So what we are are attempting to do is align one of our uh, parallel assets to a privacy-based chain. So you can have privacy on on uh, you know flux with uh, you know zk snarks and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So these this is all the, this is all looking at other in, individuals and what they're doing and picking the best of the best. So I call it a la carte technology. So we, we're really kind of looking at what what projects are excelling at their different platforms. So when we were looking at how we were going to deploy our NFT platform, we looked at the Solana ecosystem, we looked at the Cadena ecosystem. We tended not to even look at the Eve ecosystem and why. Well, it just doesn't scale appropriately. And mm. we go back to all the problems we had before. So, um, at least in our book, uh, we want to make sh- make sure that you know user data and user uh, privacy is absolutely essential. Security is number one. Mm-hmm. If you if you were sitting with us in our in our team meetings every week, that is number one. We talk about how we can address security, and it has been highlighted and showcased over the past two months as we've seen security 
uh, taking the back seat to speed and iteration. So we've seen these projects who have got to market quickly, but then all of a sudden now they've lost billions of dollars because there's been a vulnerability in the platform. So you're back to square one. Mm -hmm. So Flux took the exact opposite approach in the fact that we wanted to build the security pieces first. So we wanted to take the most most secure consensus mechanism, which was proof of work. We wanted to make sure we developed our node nef uh, uh, node infrastructure so that we could deploy hardened Docker's and Docker's alike, IPFS, uh, Kubernetes so on and so forth and and i think that's the good part about our project is is we 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 honestly are are not committed to any one particular uh technology because it iterates so quickly in blockchain so we want to make be a, be able to be flexible to be able to pivot very quickly uh with these different pieces so the the answer to your question is we believe that privacy is essential and mm -hmm. we believe that other projects are doing it and it would not surprise me to see a privacy-based asset be a parallel asset on the flux network mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the privacy kind of uh, concerns and the solution has been kind of always the next thing, but never the actual next thing. Yes. Um, so, so I think, but it is a really important thing to figure out how user data, especially since blockchains is one way of storing the data. Even if you have a privacy blockchain, if you index it, then you have a set, second copy of that yes. information. And if you want to search that, what would that look like? You know, if you think about the subgraphs, right? Uh, everything that's on the blockchain is copy into the subgraph, and everything in the subgraph is copy into, you know, maybe a database for a Web two, you know, style application. The blockchain information is the source, but every single time it's a rumor, and then the secret yep. becomes more and more yep. <laughs> less secretive as you go down the line. Yep, and there is a lot of value in in, in picking your partnerships and picking the teams that you work with. You look at you know Vitalik and, and when he approached Zoku and talked about zk Snarks being you know deployed on Ethereum. Yeah. These, these these are things that all of us are thinking about uh, perpetually because you know if you're not thinking about security, then you're 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 way behind the curve. You know you need to you need to have that at your at your heart. Yeah. So if you have a developer come to you and they say, I heard about your ecosystem, I'm interested in Web3 development. Um, let's say that means some sort of NFT or DeFi project on either a ETH or Solana, maybe in their own chain on Cosmo. And, and they ask you like, you know, what do I need to learn about Flux? Uh, and how can I, you know, how would your technology help me deploy my application or my vision? Uh, so in that Web3 developer migrating to the land of Web3, what is your kind of value prop to them? I would say the majority of the individuals who are developing on our ecosystem, including the team members that are part of the Flux team, uh, were not blockchain-based developers. These were regular folks who had, you know, learned coding, and they say, "How do we blockchain?" And we said, "Hey, mm. we can we can help you out with that." We actually prefer green people that have not, you know, necessarily uh, been polluted with different, you know, um, uh, you know, different programming languages and so on and so forth. We like to get them when they're when they're when they're new and 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 help them develop the skill set. So I would say this. Um, uh, I think there's a ton, ton if, if you're a current developer, the nice thing about Flux is it's been built for you. And uh, I suggest everybody, especially in, in, in the development field today, to start looking at Web3, the true definition of Web3, because Web3 has kind of been used like as a catch-all to every single thing that exists yeah. right now. So whether it's DeFi or Metaverse or, you know, whatever. And, and if you really get down to brass tacks, Web3 is infrastructure. It's the underlying underpinning pieces that are going to take those 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 uh, decentralized platforms and really make them truly decentralized and really perpetuate what Web3 truly is. So I always tell them, you know, now's the time. Like there's this opportunity has will probably never exist in your lifetime ever again to be on a ground level on the foundation and in building into something like this. And then what we do is we offer uh, different pieces to coming on. Uh, you can join Flux Labs, which is our incubation acceleration model, which uh, costs zero dollars. You just have to have a well-developed project to, uh, for the ecosystem. You can. Uh, we have grants. We have in, in excess of uh, uh, almost $200,000 hanging out there for grants for development on the ecosystem as well. So you can get paid while you're developing and learning, learning a new trade. Uh, we also have uh, um, we also have junior developer programs. So basically, you can become a junior developer on it and learn from the best of the best. Because I, you know, I can truly tell you, I think uh, our GitHub speaks for itself. If you go check it out, our devs are insane. You know, they <laughs> they work. I I get up in the morning and it's like commit, 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 commit. I mean, and, and we're not talking real meat and potatoes commit. Not I change something on the website commits. Mm -hmm. And I think that speaks for itself. And I think developers who are out there and they're they're on the fence about what should I take a look at Web three or should I not take a look look at Web three? We're telling we're here to tell you, 
you need to get into Web3 and you need to do it now. Even if it's your second job or your, or your side hustle, start to learn uh, how, to, how to really develop. And we're more than willing to help anyone that wants to deploy on Flux to, to, to learn that process. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I think I think a lot of Web3 developers, especially, or people looking at Web3 start out as solo, right? They're, they're trying to kind of enter the journey themselves. Uh, there are supporting people on crypto Twitter or whatever, might be on a conference circuit, but it is a fairly like, you know, kind of straight from the main path of, you know, tech jobs and, and, and cushy, uh, 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 you know, vacation plans and stuff like that to really explore the kind of what this new decentralized world would be. You, you mentioned earlier in the world that like, you know, these kind of more enterprise grace technology like Kubernetes uh, become something that you can support. And obviously you, you should be a sizable team uh, trying to deploy an application of certain complexity before Kubernetes is something that will help you versus yeah. being a yep. quagmire that you would never dig, dig, dig yourself out of in your weekend project. Uh, what's yep. your plan for uh, taking teams as building real application, you know, as customer or e-commerce application Application, can they expect to be able to bring their application as they have built it? Or is it really about uh, uh, kind of using the same tools, but building a new type of application uh, on top of the same Kubernetes infrastructure? That, that, that's an excellent question. And, and that's one that we get quite often. And, and the fact that, you know, what, we, what we've done is essentially kind of built an infrastructure that allows people to come in and deploy at, at their own wishes. And, you know, we really kind of uh, built Flux around uh, not necessarily the blockchain space. We really, I mean, on, quite honestly, that's not what our initiative was to begin with, is mm -hmm. what we built it on is the standard tech stack. So we wanted to be able to see companies like, let's say, Uber, uh, let's say there's a, a competitor to Uber that wants to be a decentralized DAO. So if they're running on Flux and they're completely decentralized or DAO's decentralized and it's managed and ran by the individuals who are participating in, in that network, governing that network, that's great. That's exactly what we want. We want autonomous organizations like that. So, you know, for our, 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 our goal is to kind of allow um, these things to just just develop because most of the it, it's very interesting uh, in, in a day's time some of the questions we get from you know large players in the space and we're not just talking the the, the blockchain space but we're talking the standard tech stack and mm -hmm. that's kind of why we partnered up with Lumen you know I mentioned Lumen again uh, these guys in Web two are, are juggernauts and for them to understand the value of Web three and to start working towards you know helping and assisting us to for deployment of our enterprise based infrastructure because we're going to need for our for uh, customers for real customers to be able to traverse both ecosystems, Web two and Web three. So you know we're not we're not about siloing people out because they they've deployed you know ninety five percent of their ecosystem in Web two and they want to test out Web three uh, with five percent of it. You know, so we want to make sure that we're inclusive to that. And yes, uh, I mean if you're doing something of that magnitude, if you're if you're hosting something that's running Kube or something like that, you're going to need to be a well developed team. So I would say this. Uh, know your limitations, <laughs> you know, come, come with friends. You know what I mean? Uh, if, if you go alone, you, you know, you'll go fast, but if you go with friends, you'll go far. So, and I think that's exactly what, you know, Flux was built for was we wanted to make sure that we opened the opportunity up for both web two and web three. And it's, it's really interesting that some of the, some of the, uh, web three purity, which is that, oh, everything's going to be a service that you use. And then JavaScript, the API it's actually taking away a lot of the power. For example, we early on, we realized that the blockchain Explorer only tells you the data uh, that uh, is available on the blockchain based on yep. account structure. But let's say you have three or four different accounts and you want to com combine them, you need to run your own database because no, yes. none of these places give you that kind of a indexing for you. So we call it, the difference is like Google search versus Gmail search, right? Gmail search is you searching your own aggregation of all the things you receive and it's kind of like searching your own memory. Whereas I think a lot of this uh, blockchain Explorer, or even the graph and subgraph is really searching the public information and, and then you have to put in a query to find yourself, right? But if you want to have your own personal server, your personal data store, your personal indexing service, you're going to need a server. Yep. <laughs> you're not going to need yep. a server acting as a node. And that's been the missing part, I think, for these things to uh, really make, make it feel like the decentralization is not just a scattering, scattering of myself, but actually a re-centralizing around that person. Where is my de things in one place? And that's, I think, where the decentralized compute node for the person is missing. Uh, yep. and, and, you know, we have software in node that deal with that. We call it the hub, like your hub around you, 
not around the project or the dApp or the protocol, just you have a hub and then it, it acts as a client to multiple things. You pull it together, make an index of it, and then you can traverse it, find it in your library and stuff like that. And that's really hard to do in a decentralized way. Um, yeah, so well, it really, and it really flips the paradigm because essentially what we what we have been dealing with for you know all of our past is is the the infrastructure was built directly around the individuals providing it. So you know yeah. they were monetizing it, they were uh, you know harvesting it, using the aggregated data, uh, building their platforms around what you're supplying them. It flips the script and it basically puts it back in the hands of the individuals who are running the infrastructure, who are participating in the ecosystem, and they're the ones that are incentivized by their participation in said ecosystem. So I, I think it's really, I think it really does, this is a paradigm shift overall. I think when you really look at what Web 2 and Web 3 is, uh, it, it is a shift. Yeah, Do you, so if I want to run my own little, like personal slice of my hub, uh, that where I'm going to have a server, not just because I'm participating in a node, how much do I have to pay to keep like this hub that is maybe to continue indexing the things that's interesting to me uh, on your network? How much do I earn in terms of the reward I get uh, because I'm participating in this uh, network? So can you give me a sense of like, what is it would be to a person who is like, hey, I want my slice, I want a node of my own. So we talked about, we talk, well, I think you're dealing with two different things here. Mm -hmm. So the first one is the participation in the network. So running in an enterprise grade, grade infrastructure. So yep. you can do that today. Uh, you can you can find out exactly what the, the profits are on those on our dashboard. Um, you know, I, and, and I highly recommend looking at it. I mean, obviously what we, do, we did was we incentivized the individuals running that enterprise grade infrastructure. 50% mm -hmm. uh, of our block reward. So 50% of our block reward goes to the miners, 50% goes to the node operators and mm. and then there is what we call node incentivization programs on top of that so if you're running a particular piece of software for a decentralized company and they want to remain decentralized they're incentivizing you with their own asset as well so for instance one that we're working with is called kda bet we're also working with one called docushield which is uh legal documents kda bet is is is, is, a, is a is basically gamification and uh, and sports betting uh mm -hmm. you know so so each one of those will allocate a particular portion of their token distribution to the individuals running the platform, so you're incentivized that way. Uh, the other, the other piece of that is uh, what we wanted to do is we really, we talked earlier about the Linux distribution model. We wanted to keep Flux absolutely bottom price. So right now, to deploy an app uh, in five instances, um, uh, you know, ac ac across these different geolocations, because we have geolocations as well, because that, that, that's an important piece, and I think we can touch on that then, mm -hmm. um, is it's 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 basically minimal. I think it's I think it was 0.9 flux, which is about 46 cents or something like that today. I don't even know the price of it right now. Mm -hmm. But you know, our our philosophy was build it. You know, you're either the biggest, you're the cheapest, or you're the best. We'll be the we'll be all three if we, if we <laughs> have to be right. So there is nobody out there that's going to touch our our price in terms of because and people say, well, how can you give the way that compute resource that Amazon is charging $138 for a server for, how can you give that away for 46 cents? Mm -hmm. The reason we can do that is because it's that has already been baked in. The, the payment to the enterprise-based infrastructure has already been baked into the ecosystem. So all we're doing is taking the, the, the compute resources that have been allocated and required for participating in the network and then providing that to developers for damn near nothing. Right, right, right. Yeah, it, it's not quite a side effect, but it's like you've allocated the space and the space can be used for more than one way. And this is yes. just kind of kind of like a positive externality of, of, yes. of the way the thing works. Yep. I mean, it's really interesting to look at the, 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 the pricing that if the if the economics is designed differently, it's not just about like we are 10% cheaper than AWS. Sometimes it, it's like, well, it's already paid for, so use it kind of thing. Right? Yeah, it's, it's like I a, mean, to, to, to us, we just want to give it back to the community to develop the infrastructure. And that's the way it should be. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we all we could easily slap. You know, we could be forty percent cheaper than AWS or sixty percent cheaper than AWS, but it doesn't matter to us. We want to be ninety eight percent cheaper right. or ninety nine percent cheaper because we, what we want to do is we want to get people that are. If you're deploying a website and you're a bootstrapped company, infrastructure is killer. It's expensive. If yeah. you ever had to deploy infrastructure on AWS, it's like it's painful every month when you get your invoice. So, you know, our goal was to create an ecosystem where anyone could deploy infrastructure. The UI UX was seamless. The experience of deploying looked a lot like a standard, you know, VPS based model like mm -hmm. AWS or Azure or one of these other platforms. And that's exactly what we've done with Jetpack and Jetpack 2.0. Yeah. One of the other, other things I want to point out as well is the fact that we are 
the only decentralized project that actually takes into geofencing and geolocations. Mm -hmm. And why is that important? Because people say, well, if you're Web3 and you're looking at being a decentralized platform, why would you want to, you know, uh, say specifically where you're going to deploy infrastructure? Well, let's say I want to be regulatory compliant and I want to be within a particular area. I still want the trappings and all the the, the bonuses that come with running decentralized infrastructure, but I also want to meet regulatory compliance because that's important to me and to my project. And by the way, the majority of the Web2 ecosystems will start mi- migrating to Flux. They're, that's a concern that they have. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when we sat down with some of these big players in the space and we said, what are some of the biggest concerns that you have? Geolocations was almost number one. Mm-hmm. Um, and mostly because they wanted to be able to be regulatory compliant, but still tap into the, the, the and harness the power of, of what we're doing with Flux. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of people think of like geolocations, like I want my application to be, new, to be uh, nothing nowhere. But in fact, it's actually better for it to be something somewhere. Yes, At least, exactly. And, and whether that is your lawyer or your, 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 your compliance officer working on them, it, you know, if you're in EU, you do get certain benefits. If you you're serving the EU customer to have an yes. EU data server. Uh, and that's something that I think people who are kind of maybe early in their career that hasn't that worked in enterprise, they think that's an advantage to be nowhere, nothing nowhere, but it quickly turns into yeah, a disadvantage. Yeah, it does. It, and, it, and it really, honestly, what it does is it sets us up to be, to, to because we are able to give that regulatory compliance and that 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 peace of mind to people that are developing on the ecosystem what it's going to do is it's going to make an exponential growth model uh, yeah. because because people are going to feel comfortable with that because it looks like something that they're already using in web 2 so yeah. i think that i think that's important so for us for the you know I, I always use this analogy my wife goes to the bank she puts her atm card in she puts her pin in she takes her money she drives off she ca- doesn't care at all about the infrastructure that got that money to her to make sure that it was taken from her account and all all the all all the behind the scene pieces. So we're the behind the, behind the scene people, mm-hmm. and we're not going to be appreciated. But except for the individuals that are deploying that infrastructure at scale, and they're like, "Boy, this is nice to be mm-hmm. able to have the the affordability, the scalability, and and the decentralization that comes with Flux, but also be able to tap into my Web two roots as well." Mm-hmm. Um, I I saw that you guys support uh, some DApps, and some, one of which that got really stuck out is that you there was a support for Matrix, which is like a chat server, it's like a decentralized yes. Slack. Have you seen people use that uh, your infrastructure to host these kind of DAO communities? Uh, around matrix or that's still early it's still early but we're starting to see uh, more of that develop out and as a matter of fact one of the very first steps that we deployed because i'm an og and i love irc we deployed our irc chat just mm. so we could say that we could we could do it what, right, right. and then what we did is we ended up parlaying parlaying that into support models where we built bots that basically took our irc chat running on flux and then aggregated that data back to discord where we were able to support people and we were using irc and decentralization and they had no idea it just looked mm-hmm. like a standard chat client yeah. so you know i i think you're going to see these communities really start to gravitate toward this once they they figure it out i mean we've seen a lot of deployments of game servers recently as a matter of mm-hmm. fact they just deployed a quake server which i'm dying to get on and start to play uh with with a bunch of the people from the group so you know th- these are you know really that's what once they found the infrastructure then that's when they start to develop those communities so i you know i think you could definitely see that uh continuing to build out yeah, it's very strange to see all of Web3 being kind of uh, bouncing between uh, a centralized Twitter, centralized Discord, and centralized Telegram, right? Like that—that yep. that is basically kind of life of a person in crypto. I mean, you know, developer go on GitHub, centralized to Microsoft, right? So, yep. so uh, it's really healthy to see uh, uh, kind of uh, these kind of open source tools that has feature parity now uh yep. kind of getting a, a better deployment model i mean you know you matrix the element company do offer a hosted SaaS service i think that's good for for initial adoption and getting yep. people to substitute but i think you know the philosophy especially with end-to-end encryption being so so baked in uh into matrix protocol will be very interested to see uh kind of data arrest encryption even if the node operator is operating a matrix node they can't read any of the messages because you have end to end well that's encryption. the that's the ultimate goal right is yeah. to make sure that we have the end to end encryption so and, and here uh, chris this is again where old technology becomes new again where you know one of our first apps that we deploy is our irc which has been around since forever yeah. right so you know this this is the opportunity to kind of showcase those pieces so you know yeah. i think it's i think it's super important that we build those communities and we also obviously uh, put a, a great deal of emphasis around the, the you know the the, the peer to peer encryption 
piece as well. Yeah. You know, we've done a lot of research on, you know, kind of exchanging data. Like, you know, we have additional data than blockchain data in a full stack application uh, for Solidify Cost Stack. And one idea that we have was a lot of the metadata, like a negotiation, let's say you're doing a uh, pro procure to pay workflow of which the payment may be a USDC transfer on Polygon or something like that. But the quote, the agreement and everything else that goes back and forth, that shouldn't be written on chain. Maybe some of them can have some on chain representation for invoice factoring, but you can put a lot of the private document in a chat room and then suddenly combination of a chat stream, an encrypted trust stream that's settled with a blockchain payment underneath it becomes a direct replacement of billion dollar infrastructure in web yeah, two and I web know. one yeah i, I know right <laughs> so, so you know the other area that was kind of unique to us was the fact that you know you talk, hear a lot of talk about oracles and you know aggregate aggregated price data well these oracles are running on centralized infrastructure so mm -hmm. you know if you're if you really truly want to get down to brass tax you need a decentralized oracle which we built so and yeah. it was on honestly it was uh you know we all got together and we were like thinking about what we could do and we built an oracle which aggregated all exchange data api data to a centralized point with would, that was running on Flux, so it runs on Flux. But then we also took it a step further and we started to aggregate social metrics as well. So you could see the aggregated pricing metrics and the aggregated social metrics right in one place, and it yeah. all ran on Flux. And it's and we named it after my dog. What's so, your dog's name? Dibby. <laughs> <laughs> so Divi, Divi Fetch was our very first, uh, was the very first decentralized pricing oracle out there. And you can see it actually now today, if you go check it out. Um, it, and, and honestly, it was super simple. The The user interface was super simple. It really just took all of the, uh, the assets that we stored in Zellcore and ag aggregated all their exchange data from all their different platforms in real time so that we mm -hmm. could, we could start to see... Uh, as we added in uh, the social aggregation piece from Lunar Crush, which is uh, basically a social aggregation uh, platform, we could see as the social aggregation started to move one way, the price would then reflect it. So then basically what we were using it as is an arbitrage tool to look for mm. opportunities. If we saw so social metrics starting to tick up over here, then we knew that we wanted to take a posi position there. So I yeah. loved it. Um, and, and I think we're going to continue to keep working on building it out. But that's, that goes back to we have these tools that need to be created and uh there a lot of them don't exist yet yeah and i think this idea of doing computational oracle that's more computationally intensive than a weighted yes. average uh, by leveraging kind of more traditional compute resources and not just smart contract which barely can do a weighted average efficiently over like 100 data points yes. uh, if you if you unleash cpu resources you can do a lot of sentiment analysis. If you put GPU yep. resources, that's I think one of the greatest kind of like sad moment I had is that I think we wrote out of like GPU proof of work a bit early before we have some other usage of all that yep. deployed GPU to do some real yep. analytics. And that's a that's a real shame. And it's a little bit of just like the the whole CUDA base, like GPU analytics, not really getting mature enough in a de de decentralized deployment model to take over for that install capacity. So when I s see people unracking GPUs, like, oh, such a wasted opportunity. How much well, analytics can we can 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 we tap if we have? Well, that? well, you're gonna love proof of use of work, and I suggest that anyone listen to this. I don't, we don't have the time to dig down that rabbit hole yet, but but essentially what we're doing is taking our our, our proof of work side, which is really just doing transactional validation and consensus mm -hmm. mechanisms, yeah. and be able to tap part of that to actually leave the, the chain and uh, provide proof useful work to folks that want to rent out of a marketplace. So if you want yeah. to rent, you know, 500 GPUs, you can do it directly from Flux now. And this is not something we're building just specifically for Flux. We're building it for the blockchain ecosystems because we, 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 uh, you know, I, we're going to fall down that rabbit hole and I'm not going to head there, but, but, you know, a lot of proof of work has, has kind of taken a, a, a pretty bad beat up here recently about environmental impacts. And yeah. our goal is, is for flux to be carbon negative. And you say, well, how can a project that's proof of work be carbon negative because it's taking useful computer uh, hardware and deploying it, doing something that somebody would need to purchase anyway. So, yeah. you know, now Dan doesn't have to buy, 20 GPUs to be able to do from rendering. Google GCP, right? Google yeah. Cloud, right? Now, you know? now I can just yeah. simply deploy that from the marketplace. So this, yeah. this, this is the next step of where proof of work is heading, and uh, that's a that 
we're going to have to do another one of these. And I think so. <laughs> I, it's super exciting. We have a lot of algorithm. We have a data science team that's working on doing on-chain and off-chain analysis. Because we have a hub, we have a service system, uh, we do have the ability to leverage non-blockchain data sources. But one of the things we always want is that can there be a trusted place where they will crunch the data and tell me if this wallet is trustworthy, yep. for example. Yep. And that is not something you can do on smart contract. You can certainly run your own little like you know server and have your own proprietary trading advantage. But if there is a common way with a node that is doing this useful work and being uh, like shared among other people, that would be a really nice way of doing credit scoring without trusting a couple of government agency and the delegates for some Amen, things like that. Amen, brother. And and we'll be talking about this okay. much more, I can tell you. You, you got, you got the that. idea. You okay, got the idea. this is great because we've been always thinking about what is the deployment architecture of these GPU-based uh, processing would be. Uh, we will do, we'll touch on that again, but I think we touch on quite a bit on the thing yeah. that is today, and we just kind of maybe have a cliffhanger for the future of Flux on this proof of useful work. What a perfect place uh, to uh, to kind of uh, take a break. Uh, and uh, is there anything else you want to share with uh, you know our community of people interested in user experience or your community uh, trying to like see the, your place within this Web three ecosystem before we? Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, one of the one of the points that you brought up earlier, uh, I, I think that you know Web three can be uh, mildly ter uh, ter territorial, right? Tribalistic, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah. And what I would say is, I would just, I would caution everybody, uh, you know, don't worry about your bags because honestly, we're very early on. I think there'll be, I, I don't call people competition, I call them opportunity. Yeah. So you have a very unique opportunity to get into these th these projects very early on. And if you look at, at cooperation and building out, then you're looking at building out the ecosystem for all. So, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of people are like, who's going to be the next Google? We are we are all going to be the next Google. And that's the thing that you have to remember. So our, our yeah. goal is ultimately put it back into the hands of the people. So if yeah. you want to learn more about us, runonflux.io. You can follow us on Twitter at, at runonflux. We have a Discord. We have Telegram. Telegram's a lit, little uh, wild, wild west, so be careful going in there. There's no uh, no clue what you're going to get there. But uh, you could also follow me directly. It's uh, at uh, DAK underscore flux uh, on Twitter as well. It's fantastic, and, and I think this is such a great conversation. And as always, we always thank our community uh, for being open-minded about hearing different projects doing different things. And this is super interesting. We, there will be a part two on proof of useful work. Amen. Uh, Let's do it, Chris. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yes. Uh, and then and, and 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 as always, we do this uh, premiere every Wednesday uh, Eastern time at nine a.m. Uh, uh, and hopefully, you can join us for the next one. And until next time, take care. Thank you.